Ah, oh boy. Let's bring another one of these over here. Okay, play this one. Commencing playback. Following his recovery, the agent's personality was altered significantly, including his behavioral and speech patterns. Because of this, I made the decision to remove the agent from the Argentum unit. In order to prevent any possibility of memory recidivism, Plutonium received a new call sign, P3, and is now under my direct command and observation. P3's contact with Argentum has been kept to a minimum, and Argentum personnel have been warned against mentioning the call sign Blesna in P3's presence. Crispy. I'll get another one. What? Sechenov has you on a leash. He does whatever he wants with you. Listen, Doc, you saved my life. Do you think I don't know I'm a test subject? That's my job. <laughs> so you're a volunteer, huh? Then why are you such a disobedient test subject? Because before they always told me what they were doing. I'll go get another recording. Huh. Argentum. We've heard a lot of mention about Argentum, so Argentum is this Blesna person, I guess. And from what we read on the pair up there, it's almost like, I don't know, maybe our character had feelings for this Blesna, maybe? Important message, June 3rd, 1955, from Klimov to Klimov. From M Klimov to Y Klimov. Let's go, B2. Important message number two. From M Klimov to Y Klimov, Miss A10. Are they playing Battleship? Miss, give up already, B10. Uh, June 3rd, 1955, from Senior Lab Assistant E. Debel Tovskaya to Lab Assistant Y Klimov. Are you nuts? Do you really think I can't see what you're doing from up here? Why are you using your workspace to play Battleship? They told me not to let the Klimov brothers work together, but I didn't listen. If I see this again, I'll keep one of you here and have the other one transferred to Vavilov to plant potatoes. Get back to work. Archive conversation number seven. Date delete or data deleted. Well, date deleted. From Zaharov to Sechenov. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, Dmitri, I don't want a new body. And it has nothing to do with me putting on airs, as you put it. There's just no point. I'm much more productive in this state. It's simply more practical and useful for myself and for you. You already have your Ekaterina dolls following you around. Leave me be. So they want to take... So how, how's he talking to Zaharov? You know. I don't want a new body. Or is he just talking about like he's just in an old body and they're talking about giving him, giving him a new body? Maybe that's what they mean. Rough draft from... Uh, the archive to why Klimov adds some conclusions at the end. It's really dry. Just a little while ago, what if conversations were at best the purview of statisticians and an analysts, depending on the topic in question? But today, thanks to Lebedev's quantum systems, predicting alternate histories has literally become a science. This has allowed us to get a very accurate report on the history of the Soviet Union and World War II if the party had not approved Sechenov's project to roboticize our troops in the late 30s. This theoretical report has received the designation 5P at the Academy of Consequences. Stage 1, Defeat Due to the novelty of the technology and the weak ad adaptation of our manufacturing capabilities, the robots turn out to be unable to resist the Wormacht's forces, and initial casualties are colossal. Soviet Union loses all its territory up to Moscow. Stage 2 Regrouping Toward the middle of the war, human casualties and pressure from the Reich become so great that the Red Army's only salvation lies in building more advanced combat robots in order to make up for lost soldiers. The process of manufacturing new combat robots is reformed and enhanced in the Urals in Siberia. Stage 3, Respite. Yikes. Um, seeing the Soviet Union's defeat and refusing to believe in upcoming robot upgrades, Allied troops concentrate their forces and become more aggressive since they understand that the Red Army will no longer be cannon fodder in the European war. 
the Reich halts its advance deep in the, into the Soviet Union and switches to the Western Front. Stage 4 Breaking Point Massive battalions of robotic troops with various functions carry out highly effective sudden attacks, reclaiming our captured territory in a matter of weeks. In the winter, their mobility and lack of reliance on food and medicine give the Soviet machines a massive advantage. Stage 5 Victory Even before the creation of the V-2 rocket and the failure of the Brown Plague, Soviet robots liberate most of Europe. Since the world's population is never reduced by illness, we find ourselves in a fragile world where a weakened Soviet Union is forced to rely on the might of its technology. This was a an alternate history theory or whatever. Um, alrighty. Keep track of which pairs I've already read. Uh, let's see, this one here. Uh, about Na Naushkin. June 7th, 1955, from lab assistant K. Zakarina to lab assistant M. Iosipova. This is really cruel, Maria. I get it, Naushkin is a pig, but this is just unprofessional. What if he actually goes to the supervisor, or even worse, worse Sechenov, and starts talking about how his work is magically cataloging itself? Then, when they see who's doing it all and find out it's just a nasty prank, what are you going to tell them? That Nashkin seduced you in Gagra and wouldn't marry you, so you started sabotaging the lab? You need to stop. If anyone asks me about this, I won't cover for you. It's happening again, June 7th, 1955, from Nashkin to Ayasapova. I'm serious, Maria, it's happening again. My catalogs are splitting up and restructuring themselves on their own. I measured it. I've got a spreadsheet. I think the entire archive is operating like collective, only separately. What if we accidentally created a self-learning system that can think and make decisions? I mean, with all the other insane stuff going on here, does that really sound that crazy? I'm going to try to run a reverse Turing test on it. I haven't slept 72 hours, but if I'm right, we're all getting a promotion. P.S. Sorry again about what happened last winter. Huh. Okay, June 7th. June 7th. <laughs> Archive conversation number 23. Uh, from Sechenov to someone. Agents Blesna and Plutonium are extremely valuable employees. Saving their lives is a top priority. I will perform the operation myself. Congratulations, April 20th, 1955, from lab supervisor A. Privilov to all. On behalf of facility management and myself personally, I would like to congratulate you all on a magnificent beginning to this reporting period. Our close-knit team has proven yet again that a spirit of camaraderie and efficient teamwork can yield stunning results. In regard to the aforementioned, aforementioned it is my pleasure to announce that this month, every Archive employee will receive a bonus and, in the interests of enlightenment, everyone will also receive complimentary tickets to Director Lestochkin's theatrical performance. Contact the venue for details. Thank you, comrades. Performance, huh? And then there's this uh, pair over here, and I think this is the first one we looked at, right? Yeah, creepy. I wish that these stayed as marked, you know, so that I do know that I've already read them. See, they show up as un unread again. But, you know, we're not logged onto the system, so, you know, it doesn't know who we are. How could it keep track? Okay, so we've read all the pairs on this side of the room. There's one right here. Question mark, exclamation point, from Y Klimov to M Klimov. Are you cheating again? You sank my aircraft carrier. E2. Frowny face. You sank my submarine. D8. Another face. What are you, simple? If you got a hit at A10, there can't be anything at B10. Did you forget that you can't put the ships right next to each other? 
Or is this going to be like last time? Is that an actual rule in Battleship? You can't put the ships right next to each other? I mean, I would never do that anyway, I don't think. Uh, exclamation points from Senior Lab Assistant E. Debolts. Double Tavskaya to M. Klimov. Are you nuts? Okay, so there's this message again about that. Uh, archive conversation number nine from Zaharov to himself. Vice is a physiological condition. In the magnum opus of the opium of the masses, the Bible, this is demonstrated clearly if indirectly. Man learned of vice not after eating of a, a mystical fruit, but after coming to know himself. The body dictates vice to us. We want to procreate, so we become rapists and perverts. We want to eat, so we steal money and food. We want pleasure, so we surround ourselves with senseless, senseless luxury. Man is not given to vice on his own. What pushes him toward it is his limited primitive shell, which requires food, sex, drugs, and care. Only the brilliance of pure intellect can illuminate mankind's path forward because man is not a body. He is a way of thinking. Interesting. Certainly a, one way to look at things, I guess. Radio of the Future, March 18th, 1955. 55 from Stenography Department to Archive. Excerpt from a paper by Lebedev. In response to those who are curious about the radio of the future, yes, we really can listen to radio broadcasts from the future. Literally. How does it work? If you read any of my previous papers, you'll find out, but you aren't really interested in the technical details, are you? You're interested in what it can do for you. You want to know if you can buy a lottery ticket knowing that it will win or avoid a nuclear holocaust. Am I right? It's not that simple. Sorry, mouse. Uh, what we are hearing is a probable future. What could happen in 10, 30, or 50 years based on what's happening right now. But we have never, I repeat never, heard the same broadcast twice. A week ago, the Soviet Union crumbled in 1989 and ceased to exist as a country. This morning, we heard a presentation by the General Secretary of the Communist Party from 1999. One day, we intercepted an emergency message about the launch of nuclear missiles in 1976. I was horrified. The future does not exist yet. Please remember that. All we can hear is an echo of an infinite, quantumized multivariance and extract the most frequently repeated tendencies from it. What we will actually see tomorrow is entirely in our hands. <laughs> and then to file with the archive, this is a 1954 from Lebedev to Klimov. Comrade Klimov, do you seriously want to get data on an alternative timeline in which the Third Reich never invented the V2 rocket? You want to know how the world would be different? Okay, I'll tell you. It wouldn't. Do you know why? Because the invention of new weapons is called an arms race for a reason. It's, if it's a race, that means someone has to come in first. In our history, the Germans came in first, although it didn't particularly help them. But the American were nipping at their heels, as were we and the Brits. Yes, the V-2 had an astonishing influence on missile design and the space program, but it was just a matter of time. Can you tell me who invented the radio? Was it Popov? Marconi? Hertz? Tesla? You know what's really interesting? What would have happened if the damn fascists hadn't invented that plague of theirs and mowed down half the world's population? From now on, don't bother the alternate prediction department with childish questions in the vein of who'd win in a fight, a shark or a bear? P.S. The bear. Obviously. I mean, obviously. Uh, wow. Got more pairs down here. Final letter. 1984? What? F date. Sverdlov 1, 1984? From G. Svoboden to G. Svoboden. Hypothetically speaking, thanks to today's discovery of supplementary biphoton quantum entanglement, I can actually send this letter into the past, say 30 years ago, to myself at this very terminal. For example, I can write a message to myself dated June 9, 1955, saying, Run! 
The robots have revolted. Save yourself. Unfortunately, this is just a theory. We're actually quite far from actually communicating with the past, so I'll have to carry the memory of that day until my death, 63 years from now. Whew. Data deleted. File attached. Let's listen. After the incident, Plutonium's brain was no longer suitable for a spark polymer extension. So I designed a similar polymer-based brain function extension for him called Voschod. Cheriton, may he rest in peace, would be pleased to hear that his designs had not been wasted. Hmm. Review number 500. This is to Sechenov. We don't know who from. Plutonium is recovering following neural adjustment and the installation of the Voschkod module. He has no memory of his wife. Oh, I didn't realize it was his wife. The events in Bulgaria or any of the other data you indicated. He is in an extremely tenuous psychological and emotional state. As an active Argentum agent, he is already fit for duty awaiting your orders. Okay, okay I guess Argentum is just the name of a project, not any one specific person. P.S. Unfortunately, during a key phase of the adjustment, an employee expressed sympathy with the agents, describing them as returning from their ordeal as crispy critters. This expression has since become an, inextri an inextricable part of the agent's psychorhythmic and emotional background. If necessary, we could perform another adjustment in order to fix this linguistic oddity, but it would take time. Oh, there you go. There's the crispy critters origin story. Back here. Another wordy pair. Are you willing to die? May 11th, 1955, from publishing department to printing archive. Are you willing to die? Then you are our man. Speaker. Despite the march of progress, one fact remains. Flying to the red planet is a risky, dangerous proposition. Reporter. Who are the people who will bring the light of humanity to Mars for us all? Speaker. I think that the first trips to Mars will be very, very dangerous. The risk of a lethal outcome will be high, but it can't be helped. Are you willing to die? Then you're our man. Reporter. How would you describe this mission? Speaker. I think it's the most inspiring thing I could possibly imagine. Life should be something more than just solving everyday problems. When you wake up in the morning, you should think about the future with ecstasy. You should feel inspired and love life. Here's one called Short-Sightedness. March 1st, 1955, from Publishing Department to Printing Archive. At your request, I have reviewed the compilation of absurd quotations from bourgeois figures that have since been utterly trounced by progress and Soviet science. Uh, 1876. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. William Orton, President of Western Union. The Americans have need of the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. Sir William Price, Chief Engineer of the British Post Office. 1889. Fooling around with alternating currents, just a waste of time. Nobody will ever use it. Too dangerous. Thomas Edison. Get rid of it. We don't want to make fun of Edison. Okay. 1921. The wireless music box has no imaginable commu commercial value. Who would pay for a message sent to nobody in particular? David Sarnoff's partners in response to his request to invest in the radio. Mention that the radio was invented by Alexander Popov. I wonder if that's true. I actually don't know. I just thought it was Marconi who invented the radio. But maybe that's not true. 1926, while theoretically and technically television may be feasible, commercially and financially, it is an impossibility. Lee DeForest. Get rid of it. Our citizens don't care about commercial or financial success. 1932, there's, there is no basis whatsoever. Sorry. Uh, on which to suggest that nuclear power will ever be possible. It would mean that man has learned to split the atom. 
Albert Einstein. Very good, but make sure Einstein actually said it, otherwise it'll be like his riddle. 1936, a rocket will never be able to leave the Earth's atmosphere. New York Times. This one is simply magnificent. Their very first issue. 1946, the working man always has been and always will be, but the robot is nothing more than a flash in the pan, Henry Ford. Television won't be able to hold on to any market it captures after the first six months. People will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. Daryl Zanuck, producer and one of the founders of 20th Century Fox. Not sure about this one. Don't publish it until the party sorts out its relationship to entertainment programming. 1949, where a calculator like ENIAC, the first computer, today is equipped with 18,000 vacuum tubes and weighs 30 tons, computers in the future may have only 1,000 vacuum tubes and perhaps weigh only one and a half tons. Popular Mechanics. Good, but translate the name Popular Mechanics into Russian instead of leaving it in English. 1951. There is practically no chance communications space satellites will be used to provide better telephone, telegraph, television, or radio service inside the United States. T. Craven, FCC Commissioner. Underscore the fact that maybe they can't do it, but we sure can. 1955, there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. Ken Olson, founder of Digital Equipment Corporation. An unknown feat, it says. February 14th, 1955. From publishing department to printing archive. This is a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff, a lot of good information here. Really fleshes out the world but I kind of wish they would have spread it out a little bit instead of it all being in this one room. Excuse me while I take a drink of water. All right, an unknown feat. Andre Rayanovsky's unknown feat draft of an article. For a long time, Andre Rayanovsky's name was spoken of with contempt and dismay in Soviet scientific circles. As a capitalist and idealist who fled the Soviet Union, and a vocal critic of the party's authority and the ideals of communism, it was obvious that a good relationship with him was simply impossible. However, later, when Rayanovsky tellingly grew disillusioned with American ideals, his rhetoric changed, and his relationship to the motherland changed along with it. It goes without saying that this move led to a hue and cry in the West and genuine glee in Rav Rayanovsky's homeland. Nowadays, Andrei Rayanovsky has successfully developed his deep sea dwelling project with the aid of underwater engineers from Sahalin and is considered a true friend of Soviet scientists. Soviet science and facility 3826. Thanks for all the fish. December 9th, 1954 from publishing department to public printing archive. Uh huh. All right. Needless to say, large scale projects to conquer outer space and colonize planets are laudable and worthy, worthy of respect. Man has always reached for the stars, but let's be honest there's nothing out there. Space is a cold, empty, inhospitable place without any hidden mysteries. All that awaits us there are resources and the satisfaction of mankind's ego. Our home is another matter entirely. I'm referring to the Earth, or more precisely, the ocean. We know less about the depths of the ocean than we do about the dark side of the moon. According to available data, only 2-5% to of the world's oceans have been explored. Evolution can't help us in space, but underwater, it can reveal our true potential. In this article, you will learn about the potential benefits of exploring and conquering the ocean. To put it bluntly, What's the point in flying to the far reaches of space when our own home holds more secrets than any other planet? Here's archived conversation number 38. This is a fairly old one, October 1st, 1952, from Sechenov to Stockhausen. Michael, I've been receiving very unambiguous reports about what's going on at the theater. If even a portion of what my informants have been telling me is true, 
I'd like to conduct a certain experiment. Give them free reign and curtail any security measures. I want to know if even Soviet citizens and facility employees can be capable of moral failings. After two months, find an excuse for us to visit the place. Tell them Vavilov has achieved amazing results and we want to celebrate it. Invite VIPs. I want to see this with my own eyes. Here's something called Evolution? No, Revolution. This is from 1953. The time has come to acknowledge that we are careening into the future at an amazing speed. Our scientific machine is running at full capacity and the most talented Soviet citizens are working day and night to advance the cause of progress. But what of evolution? It remains in the distant past. The 1917 revolution demonstrated that it was, it was possible to tear down the old and erect the new in its place. The same goes for the decrepit monarchist phenomenon of evolution. Now, man is not just the pinnacle of creation, but a creator himself, and he has the ability and the right to alter himself in accordance with its desires. Gills for divers, wings for first responders, flame retardant skin for firemen. This is just a small sample of what awaits us in the near future. We are no longer grist for the mill of natural selection. We are natural selection. From Comrade Sechenov's lecture to the Soviet Academy of Science, Science is 1953. Whoops, I keep hitting escape to exit this screen, but it's not right. And then, ladies and gentlemen, another pair right here. This one. Auspicious timeline, it says. Academy Archive Prediction Department. In light of current auspicious tendencies, we expect the following fundamental breakthroughs in the near future. 1959, widespread use of low temperature nuclear reactions. End of the oil and gas era. Probability 87%. 1961, full-fledged human cloning. Probability 100%. 1967, transport of Martian soil to Earth. Probability 64%. 1970, last coal mine closed, end of the Stakhanov age, probability 96%. 1971, all planets united by a single communications network, probability 45 to 87%. 1972, destruction of nuclear weapons, probability 13%. 1975, first space hotel and space tourism, probability 69%. 1980, money no longer used in the Soviet Union, allied nations, and a number of Western countries. Currency replaced with megawatt hours as a unit of exchange in USA, probability 50%. Here's archived conversation number 51. This is from Vavilov. Uh, regarding the Nailovs, we, we remember them, right? Hemlock is demonstrating a great deal of activity within Anna's body, but it is not ready to rep reproduce yet. As for her husband, I want you to fully exploit his potential. We cannot lose staff members. Perform the necessary operations and put him in a hospital room under surveillance. This experiment is too unique. There's only one way the plant can reproduce. If it doesn't work, we'll have to start all over again. And here is inauspicious timeline. Academy Archive Prediction Department in light of current inauspicious tendencies, we expect the following threats in the near future, 1961, spike in criminal activity due to increased free time among citizens, probability 32%. 1968, large social and economic rift between roboticized and non-roboticized countries in the appearance of outcast countries, probability 43%. Man, these guys put a lot of thought into this game, right? Gee whiz. 1972, growth of nationalistic attitudes among minorities as well as a drive for revenge and a denial of pan-human values, probability 98%. 1974, increase in epidemiological threats, overpopulation in outcast countries, shrinking populations in advanced countries such as European countries, the USSR and China, probability 59%. 1976, breakdown of educational system, degradation of the humanities, and segmentation in technical specializations, probability 33%. 1980, 
1978, decreased aptitude for education, short attention spans, and a focus on small doses of information among the populations of advanced countries. Probability 99%. 1979, increased religiosity, religious fundamentalism, and terrorism. Probability 71%. 1980, extreme repression in progressive countries, reduction in the speed at which laws are passed, increased absurdity in enforced laws, and opposition to freedom of thought among citizens, probability 100%. Also 1980, collapse of industry due to technological malfunctions, probability 68%. So who's still out there? Who is still with me as I read all of this stuff from all of these pairs? It is a lot of stuff. Let's go grab another one of these bobbins and bring it to Larissa there. Um, I believe we've got them all from this side. Oh, is there only one more? Oh, there's only one more. Well, I think we need to read... I'm sorry, but I think we need to read all of the pairs before we do that. Because I worry that that may trigger something. Auspicious Timeline Audio Archive. Let's take a listen. Yes, yes, it's part of the experiment. You won't see anyone. Not me, not anyone else. Okay, subject. You will now have a conversation with two young women. Their names are Betsy. That's me. And Olga. Hello. I need you to talk to them and tell me which of the young ladies you spoke to is not a human being, but an artificially generated voice. Is that clear? Yeah, sure. I get it. You may begin. Uh, so, Betsy, do you have any kids? I'm afraid not, but I want to have two when I finish my internship in about three years or so. Huh, okay. And here's the last one, Olga. Could you ever kill someone? Me? I don't know. Maybe if they were an enemy or trying to hurt people. Yeah, I, I guess I could do it to protect the motherland. Excellent. We're done here. So, which of the two young women you spoke with is a machine? I think it's Betsy. Yes. So, you think Olga is human? That makes sense to me. Please note that I never told you that either of them was human. So they're both machines? Actually, none of the individuals you've spoken to during this experiment are human. Uh, thank you for your time. Please escort the subject out. <laughs> All right, that was interesting. Uh, Raven 1, June 1st, 1955, from M. Ilyushin to Academy News Prediction Department. The Raven 1 satellite was launched into orbit but we were immediately notified that it had malfunctioned. That's the official version, anyway. The unofficial version is more complicated. The Plush samples on the orbiting satellite began to, behave in a com behave. began to behave in a completely unexpected fashion in zero gravity and independently terminated communications with Earth. Two years later, in 1957, we're planning to send a remote-controlled module disguised as another satellite to shed some light on these events, but until then, Raven 1 will be described as a failed, shuttered project in all official documents. Archive conversation number 51. This is another section off about our character. Plutonium is to re be removed from Argentum. He will report directly to me. As for this linguistic oddity of his, leave it be. It will give him elements of a new personality perform the necessary operations, install the module, and put him in a hospital room under surveillance. We can always turn a positive into a negative. Uh, what's with these cartoons? December 30th, 1954, from Facility 3826, Deputy Director M. Stockhausen to Neptune Management Staff Animation Department. Who are you planning to show this to? I can't deny that the Pioneer is excellent, and the Capitalist is also extremely convincing, but did you even read the assignment? These are supposed to be cute little cartoons about Argentum's amazing equipment, so every schoolboy would dream of becoming not only a cosmonaut, but also a stalwart defender of the motherland. But you've got blood, guts, and death all over the screen. Does this really seem cute to you? 
Does it seem like light entertainment for kids? Regardless, some parts were certainly amusing. But, the cart but these cartoons simply won't do. You need to redo them from scratch. The composer will get a promotion and the director will be sent to work at the Vavilov Complex. And then also up here on this level is this. Uh, about the article, May 19th, 1925, from Pivrolov to de blah, blah, blah. Here's my opinion on your article on the culture of instant messaging. All in all, I think it's well written. It's succinct and it does a good job ex of explaining the concept of developing faster ways to transmit text. The comparison to mail, then the telegraph, then the telephone, and then finally the terminal system is quite good. However, your frivolous dalliance with depicting emotions via text seems entirely out of place or even theatrical. How do you imagine people will use punctuation to fill a text-based message with emotional content? People still, people still don't even understand the difference between a dash and a hyphen, or a comma and a semicolon, and you want them to start using these characters to communicate their mood? It's truly absurd! Get rid of it. Exclamation points uh, from Aya Soposa to this person. Ekaterina, I read what you wrote about using a colon and a parenthesis to make it s make a smiley face. It's a cute idea, but Privilov will never approve something like that. I think you'd be better off doing it a different way. Remember how people used to abbreviate words in telegrams? Maybe if you want to show you're happy, you could write hap. And if you feel sad, you could just write sad. Think it over, Maria. Archive conversation number 10. From Zaharov to Sechenov, Dmitri, I read your plan to install me in an implantable module. Meaning Charles. I value your persistence, but I must repeat yet again, I have no desire for arms, legs, hair, or the need to waste time eating and going to the bathroom. I'm fine, Dmitri, but your weak-minded desire to anthropomorphize everything under the sun is making me uneasy. Instead of thinking about how to put me into the head of some muscle-bound member of the Communist Youth League, why don't you find a way to cast off the burden of your own aging flesh? Here's an excerpt from Technology for Kids, November 19th, 1954, to Privilov to Debaltovskaya. From a comprehensive article from Technology for Kids about the facility... About the facility, there's no period. In the West, smart, educated people call us Homo Sovieticus. They're proud to have discovered... Uh, sorry. Um... They're proud to have discovered this type of person, so they came up with this nice name. They also use this name to humi humiliate us and put us down. They don't realize we've done something more. We were the first to breed this type of person. But in the West, all they can do is come up with new words for things, and they think this contribution to history is much more important than our accomplishments. The West's high opinion of itself is deserving of ridicule. P.S. At Sechenov's request, find references to Homo Sovieticus throughout the entire database and change it to Homo Futurum in every instance. Okay. Well. Good golly, there's at least three more pairs up here. Let's... Oh my goodness gracious, people! I mean, I, I, I'm I'm okay. I'm okay with this. I just wish that I could spread it out. You know that there's no saves around here. I can't save, so I just gotta keep on moving. Because I don't know whether we'll ever be able to come back to this room, and I don't want to miss anything. So onward we go, and you know if you're still there, great. And if not, well. I'm reading it. Fix this ASAP. June 3rd, 1955 from Vavilov Archivist D. Semushev to Vavilov Archive Department. Oh my God, I can't believe how much stuff is here. Uh, I've gone over the materials for the Science and Life article, but in nature, there is no competition within the same species, only among different species. A wolf eats a rabbit, but a rabbit doesn't eat another rabbit, it eats grass. Nor does wheat get in the way of other wheat. 
but wheatgrass, saltbush, and sow thistle are all different species, so if they show up somewhere where wheat is growing, they will take its food and compete with it. Who wrote this nonsense? Are you trying to embarrass the entire Soviet Union with this crap? All right, here's a complaint. June 1st, 1955 from Vavilov to Semeshev. Dear Comrade Semushev, I am utterly stunned by your careless attitude to the censorship getting tired Censor censorship of materials that have been published following your consultation in a number of periodicals references to the complex as cut off from real life or having a poor connection to our production facilities are simply false Vevilov complex is first and foremost a scientific institution that operates according to a specific plan our theoretical work is bound up in the most substantial way with practical issues related to seed cultivation and the facility's future designs. A man would have to be blind to deny the enormous accomplishments Vavilov's team has made in so little time and under such trying circumstances. The Institute's research is laying the foundation necessary to develop a real-world project to conquer new worlds. Going forward, please be more mindful of how our work is depicted in print. Here's a report, Vavilov to Semeshev from the Archive Department. Or, I'm sorry, from Semeshev to the Archive Department. Seeds, tons, process packed. Okay, a bunch of weed, a bunch of buckwheat, lithops, eucalyptus, sweet. I'm not reading all this. P.S. Double check this data, especially about the dandelions. It's clearly an error. What are we supposed to do with 40 tons of dandelions on Mars? Make dandelion wine? Uh, to submit to the archive, April 20th, 1955, from Nukov to Semeshev. Project Hemlock has been halted and deemed unfit for further study. You are hereby informed that all materials pertaining to Hemlock are to be cataloged as top secret under designation A2, organized and filed in the appropriate sections. Any further references to it in other documents are to be redacted via the standard system. Be especially mindful of information about any employees who are allegedly injured during the project. Delete the names of casualties. Excerpt from Life Magazine, March 13th, 1955, from Academy of Consequences Secretary's Office to Semeshev. Despite its secrecy, Argentum, silver in Latin, has already become the stuff of legend in a number of European and American publications. Journalists are surprised by its extremely small staff, its incredible training and equipment, and its name, which is very atypical of the Soviet Union. You've got to admit, compared to abbreviations like Smirsh and NKVD, it comes off as odd and clumsy. Rumors vary. The squad's soldiers are described either as enormous red-eyed bears who eat children or athletic blonde supermen, one look at whom would have driven Hitler to dissolve the Reich and admit the German ubermensch's defeat. They are a mystery and will remain one. But we can say this much for certain. Argentum is currently the best trained special forces squad on Earth. And given the Soviet Union's plans, it could become the best trained squad in the solar system before long. Archive Conversation number 22 to Sessionov. Comrade Sessionov, following the events of Bulgaria, agents, agents Blesna and Plutonium have both returned in a coma. They are in a vegetative state and are not connected to the neural network. No signs of consciousness have been observed awaiting your orders. Here's an article by Tom Wolfe. December 1st, 1954 from Academy of Consequences Secretary's Office to Semeshev. Regarding your request for excerpts about the facility from foreign media, Washington Post, May 8, 1955, article, The Soviet Union Steel Frame by Tom Wolf. Universal robotic, roboticization, roboticization? In the Soviet Union can be considered a most curious case of modern hypocrisy. Ignoring any populist questions about whether or not robots that pass the Turing test have personal identities, I am merely pointing out how absurd, and at the same time sinister, the widespread use of this workforce is. Judge for yourselves. A nation whose guiding light is an ideology that embraced equality and strives to end the exploitation of workers and peasants by capital has now subordinated an entire army of soulless machines 
that can satisfy its every whim. I don't know anything about Collective 2.0, but I'd say the Soviet Union is capitalism 2.0 writ large. The only question is when these robots will demand equal rights for themselves and how bloody the revolution will be. Here is the acceleration of evolution from Semichev to the archive department. On the acceleration of evolution, despite all their talent and the indisputable success achieved by Vavilov's research assistants, there is a concern regarding an issue that, while predictable, can only be confirmed in practice. This problem is more profound than preparing seeds for inhospitable conditions on other planets. Unlike scientists, evolutionary mechanisms do not make predictions or evaluate risk. They simply function, culling the weak and rewarding the strong. Dozens or even hundreds of factors will affect the growth and development of our cultures, so it makes sense to suggest that while working with the genetics of plants, we should begin by breeding them for faster growth and renewal rather than trying to foresee every minor detail about them. We just need to give evolution a shot in the arm, it'll do the rest for us. Which is how it's always been, by the way. My goodness. All this information. Oh, no, there's two more pairs over here. I thought there was just one. Okay, this is a short one. Lecture by A. Kaimov in 1954 from Pavlov Debate Club President A. Azarova to Archive Terminal. Speaker. When I give talks in the Soviet Union and allied countries, I am often asked whether it makes sense to focus scientific progress on making fundamental changes to the human race. We could, for example, teach people to change the properties of their skin in order to make it more resistant to heat or cold, or regrow lost limbs like certain reptiles, or control their biochemistry on a basic level. In other words, to rephrase a well-known thesis, should we strive for evolution in the individual? From the room, skeptical laughter. Speaker. My answer is no. I admit that this is, def is a defeatist attitude. But my objection does not lie in some bourgeois conception of man as the pinnacle of creation. We have access to powerful technology, and yet we should not alter ourselves to suit our environment. This would be a step backwards. Instead, we must perfect science in order to fully subjugate nature itself, whether it be here on Earth or somewhere else. Club Minutes, November 19th, 1984, from Azarova to the Terminal. Excerpt from Debate Club Minutes. Speaker 1. Maintaining the high level of technology Soviet science has achieved obviously requires people of profound intellect. This is uh, That is why the fear that a situation could arise in which technology allows society to become stupider is irrational. Otherwise, this level of technology would be ultimately unsustainable. Speaker 2, but if this threatens to divide mankind into two different groups, a smaller group with big brains that does all the intellectual activity and another massive group with tiny brains that either does the simplest jobs or does nothing at all because machines do everything for them, this is a pretty gloomy future. But is it even possible? Speaker 1, this is exactly why the population's ideological education needs to be our number one priority. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, the final, I believe, the final pair. And, of course, it's a ton of stuff. No topic, June 10th, 1955, from this person to this person. Get over here right now, please. Something's wrong. Dumb and dumber. Please change the workspace assignments for Y and M Klimov and put them as far from each other as possible. Despite these employees' excellent professional qualifications, their productivity plummets if they are able to converse with one another. Employees have been complaining about their loud laughter and inappropriate jokes. You should be ashamed of yourself from Lebedev to Privilov. I am shocked. While things of the facility usually shock me in a good way this time, I am simply outraged. The latest innovations in analyzing the structure of the future have allowed your lab assistants to make predictions of incredible accuracy and importance in it. And what are they doing? That's right, they're logging into our systems to hear the latest music from the radio of the future. 
I have no intention of disparaging the achievements of this project. Hearing music that will not be written for 30 or 40 years is truly a scientific marvel. But only for the layman. Your employees are men of science, not greasers in leather jackets and tight jeans. If anyone else comes here to save themselves a copy of the latest Billie Eilish song, <laughs> I'll cut off access for a month. All right. Uh, missing components. Lavrov to Privilov. Despite the obvious importance of the entire archive for, for Facility 3826, I have been unable to get authorization for additional shipments of superconductor material for over a year now. Before the accident, Comrade Zaharov promised to solve the problem via his personal channels. My question to you, Comrade Supervisor, is do you have any such channels of your own, or could you perhaps solve this problem for me? If not, the entire system might go belly up someday. Here's archived conversation number 19. Session off. The agent's tests have yielded impressive results. While immersed in limbo, this seemingly fragile young woman literally becomes an invincible fighter. The implications for training sabotage specialists, as well as our overall approach to secrecy, are enormous. The fighter's memory can literally be wiped without harming their skills or personality. The term sleeper agent will take on a whole new meaning very soon. This is very enlightening right here. While immersed in limbo, this seemingly fragile young woman literally becomes an invincible fighter. We're in limbo, limbo man. Uh, data deleted. Let's take a listen. Nechayev has emerged from his year in rehab a new man with new habits and behaviors. For example, he's become fond of a certain euphemism, crispy critters. It all started after one of the medics described him and Blesna as crispy critters during his recovery. He was still in a coma at the time. He suddenly leaped out of bed and nearly strangled the medic to death. The staff subdued him by shouting, we're under fire, after which plutonium ducked for cover, hit his head and passed out. Ever since then, crispy critters has become part of his vocabulary. Could it be an example of psychological imprinting? <laughs> I cannot believe how far they're going to explain the use of crispy critters. And speaking of how far they're going, I mean, this whole all these pairs in here at least in my opinion are really to just convey information about our character and this blesna or blesna or whatever um and and it's just interspersed with other stuff to make it feel more real i guess and flesh out the world which is great but really the really important things are about our character Upgrade message number seven, June 3rd, 1955 from, good Lord, look at these names. Department Secretary A. Mukometidnov to Lab Supervisor A. Privilov. Comrade Privilov, is there any way to automate cataloging on a software level? According to my calculations, I spend between five and 7% of the time it takes me to do my paperwork filing in dates and numbers. As a result, I waste about 47 minutes every day, which adds up to about 1,260 minutes per work month, or about 21 hours. That's two and a half work days I could be spending more efficiently. Have you lost your minds over there? Do something about this right away. P.S. I went to the psychologist for a checkup as requested. In total, <laughs> my sessions took 11 hours, about two of which were spent on smoke breaks. The psychologist found no deviations. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the last message. I believe. On a pair. So we are going to grab what I also believe to be the final bobbin in here. Oh, good grief. You got to... Ah, oh, good grief. Maybe good from this side. Here we go. Okay. I think this is the last one in here. Let's bring it down and take a listen. Let's give this one a spin. Procedure. Implant the Voskhod neuropolymer brain function extension. Objective. Total elimination of destructive impulses triggered by traumatic memories. Patient, Major Sergei Nechayev. Codename, Plutonium. Attempt number three. 
The first two operations were unsuccessful. The patient suffered a severe brain injury in Bulgaria, which could not be repaired. The damage is of such severity that the patient will likely have to be euthanized. Did you hear that? He wanted to kill you. The frontal lobes are partially destroyed, causing the patient to experience bouts of uncontrollable rage. The patient's steel prostheses render him dangerous to those around him. And that's about your seizures. Due to the incidence of temporary insanity, the patient is immersed in a surreal psychedelic reality that prevents him from accepting the consequences of his aggressive behavior. Uh, I don't get it. Can you translate for me? <sighs> You're not gonna like it. The patient experiences intense hallucinations. Did you see your wife again, my boy? How? How did you know that? Yet a Voskhod implant will give the patient artificial memories and allow him to overcome his obsession with his deceased wife. Your wife. It's all bullshit. I've never been married. With Voskhod, we can send the agent's consciousness into the imaginary world of Limbo via a pulse aimed directly at his pituitary gland, switching the Major into combat mode on command. I'd like to add that I am strongly opposed. What a load of crap. I mean, there's no fucking way. I'm afraid there is. Sachinov can send your mind to your own private paradise with the push of a button. And my body? Your body will kill whoever he tells it to. Fucking horseshit. What about the hallucinations? Are they also setting off? No. The hallucinations are just your brain's defense mechanism. <sighs> Why the hell should I believe any of this? The boss would never do this to me. Yeah, right. Just like he'd never wipe your wife's existence from your memory. Just like he'd never designed Collective to be a mind control system. Who said Sechenov did any of that stuff? You can't even tell who's in that chair. If you don't believe me, go ask him. What's the plan, Major? He's waiting for us at Chelome. If we want to stop Sechenov, we'll have to string him along. So you bring me there as your captive? And then what? And then we play it by ear. So that's how it is, Major. Think it over while I try to hack this elevator and get us back to the surface. Uh-huh. Paying attention now, dickbag? Major, I... I have no data about this incident. Trying to make a monkey out of me, are you? Well, join the club. Don't have any data, huh? You've always known about all this. There's a reason you're called Charles, right? You're char a ton Zaharov, you son of a bitch. Got an explanation? Huh? There's nothing to explain, Major. You're just as much a Charles to me as I am a perfect stranger to you. First, Sechenov murdered me. Then he turned me into a blob of polymer goo. Then he brainwashed you and manipulated you. How could I trust either of you? That's why I pretended to be the chatting artificial librarian. I wanted to see who was who. Yeah, well... I guess I would have done the same. So what are we gonna do now, huh? What else can we do, Sergei? You and I are friends now, and we know the truth. We need to get to Sechenov, rectify this injustice, and get revenge for what he's done to us. I guess you're right, Chariton. Justice does need to be done. You're a good man, Comrade Major. I hate to say this, but you're the first functional example of an ordinary link in the Collective Network. On Monday, everyone who has undergone polymerization will become just as malleable as you. Shit, I can't let that happen. Listen. The fucking gadget, the thought device. You can just take it off. Unfortunately, that won't help anyone. It just makes things worse. How come? <laughs> because all your thoughts are useless. A polymerized person's signal will be transmitted to robots and other equipment via their thought controller. 
but it is not what makes them a part of Collective. The Thought device can be removed, but this merely prevents the wearer from being able to make calls and give orders to machines. So how is Sechenov going to keep everybody under control? It's the neuropolymer injection that makes people part of Collective. It embeds itself in the brain and connects it to the neural network once and for all. The effect of this injection cannot be undone. Everyone who gets an injection will be part of Collective forever. But I... Was I really married? What was my wife's name? Ekaterina. And you aren't going to like what I'm about to tell you, Comrade Major. I've heard that before, but I doubt anything could surprise me now. You and your wife served with the Argentum unit. Ekaterina, or Katya as you called her, was a highly qualified agent. As a child, she studied ballet and made significant achievements in both dance and martial arts. Ballet and martial arts? Are you trying to tell me the boss is metal twins? No way. This is total BS. The boss would never do something like that. Just look at me, Comrade Major. After I died, my consciousness was transplanted into this glove. After your wife died, her consciousness could not be saved. But Sechenov uploaded an imprint of her professional skills into his bodyguard's matrices. This is... Holy shit. Fuck me, this can't be a... We've got a ride, Major. We can get out of here. And the game is saved. That was a lot of information, and I do mean a lot. But it's certainly an interesting story. <laughs> no doubt about that. Very, very interesting indeed. So I'm going to go ahead and end this episode here, uh, since the game just saved. Um, I will probably go back and re-watch that conversation there. All the way from, you know, Filat Filatova uh, and Sechenov and Charles. A lot of information there, and I suggest you do it as well. So you try to understand what's going on. I mean, I think I got it, but I'm gonna, I will watch it again before the next episode. We end this one here. Thank you guys so much for joining me on this episode. I know it was a lot of reading. If anybody listened to me read all of that stuff, let me know. I'd just like to know if anybody read it. Uh, if, you know, if I was playing this game by myself, not recording it, I would have read every bit of it. I wouldn't have read it out loud, but I would have read every bit of it because I think if you've watched this playthrough or any of my playthroughs, you know I like to do as much as possible in the game and uh, see the worlds that these talented people created. So, yeah. I was going to read it anyway. If you if you stuck with me, I'd like to know. Thanks for joining me on this episode. Hope you had a good time. If you did, why don't you let me know. Leave me a like or a comment. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.